Well, hello there. You're watching the press preview. A first look then at what is on the front pages. Time to see what is making the headlines with Matt Dathan, Home Affairs Editor of The Times, and Jessica Elgott, Chief Political Correspondent of The Guardian, uh, both with us from conference in Birmingham, as we can see. Welcome to both of you. So let us catch up then with the front pages. The Financial Times leads with the Tory tax cut U-turn, reporting that the Chancellor is now speeding up his plans to cut public debt and reassure the markets that his policies can work. The Metro quotes the Chancellor's speech after that U-turn with the headline, What a Day. The Star pictures the PM and the Chancellor in a noddy car with the headline, The Lady is for U-Turning, a parody of the famous Margaret Thatcher party conference speech back in 1980, if your memory stretches that far. One result of the U-turn, according to The Guardian, angry Tory MPs are now plotting to avert any squeeze on welfare benefits as the government tries to balance the books. That is also the lead for the eye. Trust faces a new Tory rebellion on benefits cuts, the paper says. And even the normally pro-conservative Telegraph says Liz Truss has a battle on her hands to deal with the benefit cut rebels. The Mirror calling it a calamity conference and says regardless of the U-turn on tax, the economic damage is already done. The Mail sums it all up with this, get a grip. Only the Express strikes a positive note with a call from Liz Truss for people to stick with her and that trust will be rewarded. And The Sun leads with the man who has appeared in court charged with the murder of Olivia Pratt-Corbell in Liverpool. What a reminder by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme. You can check out those front pages while you watch us. So let's return to our guests then, uh, Matt Dathan and Jessica Elgott. Welcome to both of you. Goodness, so much to talk about and I'm keen to hear your thoughts on uh, the mood at conference. But, um, you know, first of all, Jessica, talk us through, you know, what we heard, um, you know, from, from, from seven o'clock this morning right through to tonight and uh, the implications of it. Yeah, well, obviously, the news started to trickle out really late last night, um, and it was in the, in the Sun newspaper, but um, it started to trickle out into the bars of the party conference. You could see the reactions of Tory MPs in real time. So you could hear kind of yelps across the room. And, um, uh, and I think, you know, quite a lot of MPs were, were predicting to me over the course of the last few days, and probably to Matt as well, that there was... That they thought a U-turn was inevitable, and... Every time you start, I sort of started to become convinced of that, you would hear the words of Kwasi Kwarteng and Liz Truss and think, actually, you know, how, how can they possibly U-turn now after what they've, they've said? And, and yet, I think the sort of scale of the MPs' rebellion became so obvious by, by last night, and especially that intervention first by Michael Gove, um, then by Grant's Shaps. It seemed to be, you know, there was going to be a constant drumbeat of these kind of big interventions from, from the big beast back on the, on the back benches. Um, throughout the conference, you know, it was going to be a, clearly a massive distraction and potentially a, a really damaging defeat in Parliament. And that was why, ultimately, it was, you know, they had, they had to make this pretty humiliating U-turn. Yes, and as we see from the Financial Times, Matt, um, it doesn't end there. Um, November the 23rd held up as the date for this medium fiscal plan great reveal. Um, the idea is that will be brought forward. Not only that, um, possibly he'll have to start reassuring the markets, will he? What, what's the suggestion? Yeah, that's right. A couple of papers, as well as uh, Jesse's Guardian, are also reporting that uh, they'll, um, they're, they're considering accelerating that date. So we're, ha we're having to wait almost 50 days before we'd hear uh, Kwasi Kwarteng's uh, plan for actually paying for those tax cuts and the debt reduction plan. And that's, um, we're hearing that's going to be brought forward. So uh, probably another sort of if not a U-turn, then a bit of a backtracking in their financial plans. And I think we're going to hear a lot more about um, other plans that might have to be rethought. And uh, the benefits uh, announcement is really going to come into focus, I think, in the next couple of days, whether benefits rise in line with inflation, uh, as Rishi Sunak uh, announced, or, or whether they have to... Um, Although they, they won't, and I think that's going to cause a massive row in the party over the next uh, few days, and that will probably dominate. Um, and, and I think they may want to take a lesson from the, the U-turn this morning, and the, the quicker you do a U-turn, the quicker you can control it. I mean, let's not, remember, let's not forget that in budgets, we've often heard U-turns within a week. You know, we had the George Osborne pasty tax, we had yes. Philip Hammond U-turning on the uh, rise to self-employed uh, national insurance uh, within a week as well. So it's not unusual, it's just the fact that this is so politically toxic, uh, 45p uh, ta uh, tax cut on the rich. Uh, I think the politics of this is, is much more significant than those two U-turns. 
Yes, and if we look at the newspapers, they're kind of split, aren't they? Uh, reflecting on the U-turn. If you look at the Daily Star, Screech, the lady is for U-turning. Um, you know, she'd done the, uh, the interview rounds and insisted she, that she was staying put with this. Tax climb land, they say, for Poundland Thatcher. Uh, the Metro as well, you know, picking up on what the Chancellor had said. What a day. Um, what about those comments that he made? You know, he talked about, uh, you know, a little turbulence and uh, how we needed to move on and, you know, this was a distraction. And the suggestion from some that actually he was a bit complacent and there was, you know, a sense of a lack of contrition. I don't know how it went down in the hall, Jessica. Well, I think that the Chancellor's speech was extraordinary in many ways, you know, especially having to, to announce a U-turn in three weeks in, into being in office, but also because the speech didn't really kind of say anything else. There wasn't a lot, you know, there was no big announcement in Kwasi Kwarteng's speech, a bit of a, a hint at that, of deregulation of some of some areas like planning, agriculture, childcare, which we think are coming kind of later down the track, but, um, you know, potentially in, in this next fiscal event. But beyond that, not an awful lot to kind of try and move the story on or try and get back on the front foot. And, you know, in some of the receptions he's been talking at tonight, um, he's been he's been pretty kind of um, unashamed about it. He's he said, you know, we just just came into conflict with the political reality. He's never said that it's the wrong choice, and you know, I think that that's you know an interesting take that he just. You know, he clearly feels, and and potentially the PM does as well, that it was it wasn't actually the wrong decision to to to, to abolish the 45p rate. He's just been forced to do it by some restive colleagues. I mean, it's interesting the reaction to it. Um, to us, Jacob Rees-Mogg said this was all about political reality. Governments can't keep fighting into a headwind. Uh, in the Telegraph, they talked about it wasn't worth the pain of keeping it. Uh, one former minister said the 45p rate U-turn was. Um, pretty final for Mrs Truss and the backbenchers were now openly calling for her to, to leave Downing Street. Uh, if we go on to the other newspapers, uh, the I, Truss faces a new Tory rebellion on benefits cuts. And has this, Matt, do you think, given power uh, or a push to those parliamentarians who don't necessarily agree with that budget? And will we see rebellions on matters like benefits or indeed those other issues that Jennifer's just mentioned, deregulation of planning and environmental controls, for example? Absolutely emboldens, emboldens them because they know now that if you push hard enough and you've got a big enough group, you've got big enough beasts like Michael Gove and Grant Shapps uh, fighting your corner, you know that you, you, you've got that proven track record that you can force the government to U-turn. Uh, but it also emboldens um, in, in, uh, ministers inside the cabinet uh, and inside government to fight their own corner uh, privately around the cabinet table because they know that, that Liz Truss is weaker. And we're only well, less than a month into her premiership. It, it took Boris Johnson uh, probably about a couple of years to start um, becoming very weak. Um, and considering they've got, um, well, 76 majorities in now, I can't remember yeah, the latest. Like uh, uh, it's chipping away every, every week, isn't it? But um, given that they've got a 76-seat majority, it's astonishing to think how weak they are now uh, and uh, just one month into her premiership. Yes, so your paper, The Guardian, Tory plot to halt benefit cuts after U-turn over top-rate tax. Um, certainly we've seen um, people like Michael Gove, Grant Shapps, you know, the cheerleaders-in-chief for whatever rebellion we're seeing now in Parliament. But is it open warfare? One commentator suggested it was like a hung Parliament, or it will be when they go back. Jessica? Yeah, and I think that, you know, even Cabinet ministers today were, you know, kind of privately expressing some doubt about the case for um, landing spending cuts, um, you know, directly on the poorest in society, especially in a, in a kind of cost of living crisis. Um, and I think that there will, there will need to be a really tough argument made in Cabinet, let alone um, to Tory MPs um, who are openly saying, you know, Damien Green, one of them today, and Esther McVeigh, the former Work and Pension Secretary, saying that they would, they would oppose anything that would, that would really hit the, the, the income of people on benefits. Um, and I think that that's, you know, something that... Uh, a lot, you know, the, the way that the argument has really changed uh, among Tory MPs, and especially the new in intake of Tory MPs, um, you know, in, in, in this Parliament. And again, I think that that's another fight that the, that, that um, Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng are potentially gearing up for over the next couple of weeks. But it's not only that. MPs are telling us uh, in the story tonight that's on the front that they also think they've got enough numbers to kind of really make sure that there's no fracking at all. There's a big coordinated effort now to, to, to kind of push back on that. Um, and, and many of them feeling that that also will be successful because, you know, they've been emboldened by the U-turn today.
And even the Daily Mail, as we know, have been staunchly behind Liz Truss. Even they are critical. Get a grip is their resounding headline, picking up that screeching late-night reversal on tax policy they'd vowed they'd stick to. Um, you know, all the word coming up, it took place in Liz Truss's suite hotel room where the mood was grim, etc., etc. A threat of new revolt on benefits we've talked about as Truss refuses to rule out more U-turns, despairing Tories tell the Prime Minister. Now, there is a body of, you know, opinion at conference, isn't there, uh, Matt, that believe she should have stuck to her guns, and without doing so, it's now a free-for-all. Yeah, absolutely. We've been talking about uh, Michael Goves and Grant Shapps of the Tory party, but uh, I was talking to quite a few of the right-wing Conservative backbenchers who are absolutely furious at Liz Truss. And so you've not only really angered the Rishi Sunak supporters and, as we said, the Michael Goves, etc., but you've also angered the right wing of the party. Uh, and, and they say, you know, never make U-turns in politics because being wrong is, is one thing, but being wrong and weak is, easy, is even worse in politics. And they are furious. I mean, I, I haven't spoken to him, but I imagine people like John Redwood are, are very furious tonight. Uh, he was um, delighted at the fact that he's, he's finally got a tax-cutting Conservative government uh, and uh, within, uh, within nine days had already U-turned on one of the main tax-cutting principles. So there is disarray across the Conservative Party and it's going to be very difficult now uh, to, for Liz Truss to pull that, uh, all those divisions back together in, what, little over, well, little less than a two years before the next election now. I mean, this, this will be unpicked, I think, for years, won't it, Jessica? Um, you know, the impact of all of this, but also, you might argue, the errors from these experienced hands. You know, the Chancellor attending a champagne reception with bankers on the night of the budget, you know, being warned about unfunded tax cuts and the possible implications and reaction of the markets, controversial tax cut not shared with the Cabinet, as we heard from Liz Truss at the weekend. But bigger than that is the legacy of this, not just the high interest rates for you know, homeowners and businesses, for the government itself, but also, and I think it was Fraser Nelson in The Telegraph last week who suggested that interest rates would have gone up anyway because of inflation, and now they've got a socking great Tory rosette on them. It's as if that, you know, it becomes the fault of the Conservative Party that they're happening. So the implications of this for, their, for the legacy um, of, of this, despite that U-turn, will, will be long-lasting, won't it? Yeah, and Labour officials are already already talking about, you know, a trust premium on your mortgage, and you can expect that line to, to, to be to be rolled out a lot over the next over the coming months and probably into the election campaign. And yeah, and I think a lot of a lot of Tory MPs think that, you know, it's 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 massive own goal and it shows a lot of political naivety. And and, and Kwasi Kwarteng and um, and Liz Truss aren't novices. I mean, they've been around government for a long time, especially Liz Truss has. And, but there has been, you know, so many basic errors. And I think it also kind of comes back to the fact that she had reasonably limited support early on in the in the Tory leadership contest. Um, you know, she was the third choice of MP, the third choice of MPs who made a, the first choice, if that makes sense. Um, and and. Even after that, even in the reshuffle, there was no kind of attempt to broaden the tent. There was a lot of people left out in the wilderness. And if you alienate all of those people and then you do a really difficult budget and, and cause kind of lots of damaging effects, uh, and then you U-turn and you also then alienate the people who've been out there defending you and essentially made to look like mugs um, when they've had to, you know, say say things, you know, on, the, on, on, your, on your shows and others... Um, you know, it doesn't leave you with an awful lot of political capital left. And what about the impact now on all those promises that Kwasi Kwarteng made in his speech today, Matt? Um, you know, promising that they were serious custodians of the, of the uh, fiscal purse, I an ironclad commitment to fiscal discipline. You know, even with this tiny change of the 45p top rate tax cut, there's still more than £40 billion pounds uncosted. So does that mean if you are ironclad, you have got to bring about cuts somewhere? Well, you'd assume so, wouldn't you? But um, hopefully we won't have as long as we'd uh, been expecting to find out. But um, I mean, I think uh, it's only really going to cause more disarray in the party when they're going to be announcing uh, budget cuts across uh, Whitehall. And, of course, we've already heard they're not going to be doing a spending review next year, which means that uh, schools and hospitals, for example, will have to find the pay rises for their staff within the existing budgets. So the budgets were already very stretched, and now he's having to go, as you say, further and find 40 billion more tax cuts, uh, sort of spending uh, cuts to, to fuel those uh, tax cuts. 
And this is all based on the premise that those tax cuts are going to fuel economic growth. Uh, but I think um, it, that, that is a massive gamble, as we spoke to, uh, after the, the mini-budget. And uh, it's going to be fascinating to see what the OBR says in its... Uh, in its fiscal forecasts um, when Kwasi Kwarteng brings forward his, uh, his spending plans um, because uh, that is going to be probably even more damaging than we've heard from Tory rebels and from the mini-budget analysis because th that is going to be independent economic forecasts telling us uh, just how bad the government's own spending and tax plans are going to to be for you and I and everyone, all, all, all our watchers and listeners. So it's going to be quite a brutal month ahead, I think, for the Conservative Party. OK, uh, Matt, Jessica, stay there. Lots more to discuss on this and other issues. Uh, more trouble at the top of government. Why Number 10 may have uh, squashed, rather, some of Jacob Rees-Mogg's plans. Uh, back with that in just a moment. Well, welcome back. You're watching the press preview with me once again, Matt Dathan, Home Affairs Editor of The Times, and Jessica Elgott, Chief Political Correspondent of The Guardian, who are both joining us from the Conservative Party conference. And, um, Matt, we've already talked, haven't we, about the, the prospect of further rebellions over some deregulations. Let's go to the um, Financial Times uh, with the headline, Number 10 quashes Rees-Mogg's half-baked work reforms, suggesting that Liz Truss has quashed a series of these ideas put forward by the Business Secretary, Jacob Rees-Mogg, to radically reform the labour market, um, such as uh, introducing no-fault dismissal for higher earners, repealing the 48-hour week, uh, etc. So, uh, what, what's the, what does the story tell us? Well, this is part of the edict from Number 10 after the mini-budget that uh, they must all come up with ideas on how to stimulate growth. And we heard that massive row about uh, immigration numbers and we need to increase possibly some immigration to stimulate economic growth. But this is... Jacob Rees-Mogg's ideas that we hear tonight, um, as you say, uh, um, no-fault dismissals for people earning over 50,000, uh, and other measures such as uh, corporate uh, requirements to, on the gender pay gap. I'm not really sure how much that's, that would save, and that would stimulate economic <laughs> growth, but uh, I, 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 I don't know. Um, but, yeah, as you say, the, the number 10 have come back, and there's a quote, I think, from a source saying that Liz Truss... Uh, uh, she's in favour of deregulation, but not quite as far as uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg might want to go. Yes, a number 10 official said there were limits to Truss's enthusiasm for deregulation, I think is the, uh, the quote yeah. from the Financial <laughs> Times. And it's it news is... to us, that's, that's for sure. Yes, exactly. Yes, you wouldn't know so far, maybe. Um, Suella Braverman, um, due to speak at conference um, tomorrow, isn't it, I think, um, considering new laws to make it easier to deport people who come to the UK illegally and will call for the French to stop more boats crossing the English Channel. That perennial as well, that issue. And uh, James Cleverley, too, the Foreign Secretary, uh, will also be speaking. Um, but one of the other issues on the front page of The Guardian, um, your paper, Jessica, is about climate. And the Egyptian government, host of the next UN climate summit, of course, has warned the UK against backtracking from the global climate agenda in an intervention prompted by fears over Liz Truss's commitment to net zero. Um, are there real fears that she's lukewarm on that too? I think I think there certainly are amongst um, you know people who have have been real champions of of net zero and you know they've probably got they've probably got reason to worry she's she's obviously ordered some new um, exploration of, of, of oil and gas um, and she said she's not going to attend um, you know the next climate summit and there's this was row in the papers over the weekend about whether uh, King Charles should attend having intended to go there uh, uh, as, as when he was prince but uh, but obviously uh, circumstances has changed and he he won't be attending but the, the Sunday Times reported that she'd essentially told him not to go something that number 10 have pushed back on a bit but um but you know again it's it, it obviously those are the things that raise hackles and you know that's why you've had this intervention with the, with the new hosts of, of COP27 you know saying the UK mustn't backtrack and and you know, Boris Johnson was seen as a really big kind of champion of this um you know across the world a real believer in the net zero cause and and obviously net zero is also something that's in legislation but you had ministers you had steve baker who's a big uh, net zero skeptic kind of hinting on a fringe today um that the only way that you could get out of the of the net zero um commitments would be to repeal that legislation i mean i think that that would be another enormous row which 
I would be surprised if, if Liz Truss uh, wanted to, to, to go down there, but, you know, maybe she would see that as a way of achieving some of her growth aims, but I think that that would cause significant distress to a lot of MPs. OK, Jessica uh, and Matt, both of you, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.